Now, this, this is, in fact, this is one of the things my cousin asked me about. We were going over, he, he brought up this very parable that we're studying. Um, we're studying the, the, the sower and the seed, and we're actually in the part where he's teaching them how to interpret all parables, as verse 13 said. He said unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then, shall ye, how, how then will ye know all parables? So the Lord is actually teaching them. He says, how will you know all parables? So if I, if I teach you how to do one parable, you'll figure out how to do the other parables. Because there's going to be three other parables in this chapter. So he starts explaining the sower and the seed. Now, I don't know who was here last week and who wasn't. But the, the, the basic is this. The story was is that a sower went out and sowed seed. Some fell upon the wayside and had no dirt or nothing. The seed just laid there and the birds take it away or whatever. Uh, then the next seed falls upon stony ground, and it starts to grow, but because it can't get any root, it withers and dies. And then, then the next uh, seed falls on, on uh, the thorns, and the weeds choke the, the seed out from ever growing, so it doesn't ever grow to fullness. And then finally, some seed fa- falls on good ground, and it produces 30, 60, or 100 full. Now that was the parable. The interpretation of the parable... I'll just go ahead and read it and tell you where, where we're going to pick up, where we left off, I believe. <laughs> it says in verse 4, it says, The sower soweth the word. Now, when we looked at that in the book of Matthew, you need to realize that a sower is a guy who's a farmer. He's throwing seed out, and that's the picture. And, and the, the interpretation of that, the sower is sowing the word. The word that you read about in Matthew, and you already know from the context of Mark, it's the gospel of the kingdom that's being sown here in the earth. It's not the gospel of the grace of God, and you're going to see how that's important to know. But it's the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, and people are going to hear that. Verse 15 says, And they that are by the wayside, are they are, are by the wayside where the word was sown, but when they heard am I missing a word there? And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So you realize the ground is the heart, and they're sowing the seed, and some finds just on the side of their heart. It doesn't go into their heart. They, they hear it, they've never done anything with it, and before they can stop and think about what was said, what the good news was offered, there's no thought process, no understanding, and as a result of that, the, the seed is just taken away. Satan just takes it out of their heart. So they, they had no root. They, they didn't even pay any attention to the gospel of the kingdom. They just let it go right by them. and has no, no bearing, didn't even work in the brain process of their mind. Verse 16 says, these, that are, uh, these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they heard it, uh, heard the word, immediately received it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure, endure but for a time. Afterwards, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So, in, in, this, in this illustration here, the, the word is heard, and, and you actually see these people understood what, what was said. The good news of the kingdom, and they're glad. Uh, but because it's on stony ground, it doesn't have any root, it doesn't get down, and so when persecution, or it says affliction, persecution arises for the word's sake... Now, there's going to be an attack against that word. And when that persecution and affliction comes, immediately they are offended, meaning that they, they fall away. They just give it up. And, uh, and as a result, there's no, no life springing up in them that is into the kingdom. Verse 18 says, And these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entered in, and choked the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So again, those that the seed that's fallen among the, the thorns is that when it hits the person's heart, they understood it. But there's the cares of the world, things of this life took more precedent. The deceitfulness of riches, their desire to hang on to their money is going to take more precedent than the gospel of the kingdom. Lust for other things, just uh, the, the things of life. They, they'd rather have those things. And, uh, and as a result of that, they become unfruitful. And so as you go through the parable, fruitfulness is extremely important to, this, uh, to, to the kingdom message, to the gospel of the kingdom. Now, we, we got down to about this point. We were talking last time. Let me just catch up with my note here.
the things that he's teaching them, in case I didn't say it by review when I should have, are not only the gospel of the kingdom, but they're the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. That is, extra details about what it's going to be like or what's going to transpire for them to enter in, and once they enter in, how that kingdom's going to come and what's going to be done in that kingdom. So all these parables have to do with, with, that, with the kingdom and added detail, prophetic details about the kingdom. Answer me this. Last week, when we were in the, when we talked about falling on stony ground, yeah, I'm sure we did this, where it says in verse 17, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure for a time. And we were emphasizing how the gospel of the kingdom is that you have to endure to the end to be saved. Do we, are we that way? Have we got that far? That, that's, an, that's an important doctrine. One of the things that I had to teach, by the way, which fits right into all this, uh, when I was at the conference, uh, there was two accusations. You know, we, we dealt with all the accusations of a mid-Acts believer. And so you know, there's all kinds of different things that people bring up to try to uh, dissuade or be convinced not to believe in mid-Acts dispensational truth. One of them is, is that you believe in easy believism. And, uh, and, and, and frankly, I don't have any problems with that criticism. I do believe in easy believism. <laughs> The gospel today is not the gospel of the kingdom. The, the gospel today is the gospel of the grace of God. The message is that Christ totally took care of all of our sins and paid for them so that God in His grace could freely give us eternal life just by believing. And that is the message. Those who criticize that message go back to verses like this and say, Oh, no, look at that. You've got to endure affliction. You've got to go through persecution. You've got to you know, make sure the lusts of this world don't carry you away and, and call this hard believism. And, uh, and, and the difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God is. There, now, I do believe God's going to help these people through that, but the gospel of the kingdom is not as easy to be saved as the gospel of the grace of God because, as you can see here, there's some things that they're going to have to endure. Um, when, when it talked about, look at, look at Luke 8, uh, 8. When it says that they're offended in... in uh, in verse 17 of Mark chapter 4, it says it a different way in Luke 8 that actually would tell you um, another way of looking at that. Luke 8 and verse 13 says, uh, And they on the rock are they which, when they heard, received the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe. Now that, that amazes me right there. Not only did we, all, we learned in Mark, they received the message with gladness. Luke just comes right out and said they believed the message. But they didn't believe it all the way to the end. They believed, uh, it says, uh, for a while believe. And in the time of temptation, see that word, fall away? Did we look at the words, the, the, the book of Hebrews about the warning about falling away? Come to Hebrews chapter 6. That's, I wasn't sure if we did that either. I know that one of the things... What we're doing right now is what I intended to do last week, but we had some visitors with us that I would, I'm sure didn't have any idea what right division was. So at the last minute, I put the chart up there to explain the difference between the gospel of the grace of God and the gospel of the kingdom so that they would benefit from the same study. So that's, that's part of why I'm not sure what all we covered last week. But Hebrews chapter 6, Luke says that those, those who, got, who were offended by that persecution or the affliction and persecution that arose, uh, those people that are on the rock, that they, they fell away. There's a real warning. In fact, when you read the book of he- Hebrews, there's a warning all the way through here. And what most people don't ever stop to do is realize this is Hebrews. And just like the God, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus Christ came and ministered to his own and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power. The, or, as, or as it says in another place, he, uh, he's not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the ministry of, the nation, to the, of Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel concerning the kingdom. Paul's program interrupted that as he goes to the Gentiles, but when you pick up with the book of Hebrews, you're picking right back up with the, the Hebrew people, God's promises to them, and the, the, the tribulation that's about to come upon them and how they're going to have to endure to the end to enter into the kingdom, and in that kingdom is when life is going to be for them. Now, in Hebrews chapter 6, you, you might... Here's a verse that people who don't believe in eternal security look at. Hebrews 6, 4, it says, For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened 
and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, did it again, they rejected Christ a second time, and put him to open shame, for the earth which drinketh in the rain and cometh, that cometh often upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receive the blessing from God. Now notice there's, not only there's that planting in the earth, but it brought forth and there was fruit. But, verse 8 says, uh, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So, verse 6 there, If they should fall away, to renew them again to repentance. It's impossible to do that. In fact, in verse 4, when it talks about those who are once enlightened, that's talking about the ministry of Jesus Christ, but it goes beyond that. And have tasted of the heavenly gift, that's the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And when I look at this, I'm not talking about individuals. If he's writing to the Hebrew people, this was God's ministry to the nation of Israel. And the the nation of Israel was enlightened. They They had the Holy Spirit poured out upon the believing remnant. They had tasted of the world to come. All those things that were taking place, they were selling their possessions. They were waiting for that kingdom to come. Now, after God has done all that, if they turn away from all that, they fall away. As verse 6, there's no more offer of repentance. Because as you come to the book of Hebrews, it's the last calling of the nation of Israel. Just They have one more chance to believe because after this, the kingdom's going to come. You don't have a chance to believe after it comes. But judgment is going to come with that kingdom. Come over to, to a passage like this. Look at, look at Jude 24. I don't know. Sometimes you, you, you read a benediction and you don't understand the, the significance of the benediction itself. In fact... I probably won't get here later. So look at, look at verse 11. And just remember all the parable that we just read over there in Mark about the different ways that plants grow and, 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 and don't come forth all the way to fruit. It says in verse 11, Woe unto them that are gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Those are three different ways that temptation is going to take people. They can learn from the Old Testament, but three different ways that are going to take them away from the truth of God's Word. And so there's announced a woe unto them. Verse 12 says, These are are, uh, spots in your feasts of charity. Uh, When they feast with you. So they're they're a group of people that are with the Jews, claiming they believe, (coughs) feeding themselves without fear. Clouds are they without water, carried about of the wind. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. No fruit, twice dead. Not only going to die physically, the second death is going to take them. So these that have departed from the truth, who, might, who are among these Hebrew believers, uh, the, these people are going to be taken away to judgment. But concerning the Hebrew believers, verse 24 says this, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling... And to present you faultless before his present, the, for the, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory, and notice majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. So they're going to go through a tribulation period, and their faith is going to be tried. And when that persecution and affliction arises, if they fall away, there's no more offer of repentance. If they're, they don't have a, if the, if the uh, deceitfulness of, of the riches of this world choke them out and they don't make it, they're going to be damned, twice plucked up by the roots and burned. But, but those who are true believers, they're going to have fruit and God's going to bring them all the way through that. He's going to keep them from falling. They're going to be kept by their faith, as Peter says it. So the, these all match what the parable here is about. So go back to Mark chapter Keep Luke 8 and Mark chapter uh, 4. Now we've read about uh, about the 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 riches of this world, um, the 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 seed that fell among the thorns, choking the 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 seed out before it has time to grow and bear fruit. And the things that that, uh, choked it out, it says down in verse 18, These are they which are sown among the thorns, 
such as hear the word and the cares of this world. Now remember, they're supposed to be looking for the world to come. That's the gospel of the kingdom. John the Baptist warned the Pharisees, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? There's going to come wrath, and then the kingdom's going to come. Thy kingdom come. But the, the people here that are among the thorns, it's the cares of this world override the desire for the next world. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Well, we know how the Antichrist is going to use the mark of the beast to control the people of this earth by taking that mark. You can't buy or sell. And if you give up, you're going to have to give up all your riches, everything that's in the bank account, because he's going to control it. You want everything in the bank account, you've got to take his mark. So the deceitfulness of riches and the lust for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Um, so, so they... I guess I need to show you the, the, the importance of fruit. Uh, look back at Matthew chapter 3. I already quoted John the Baptist concerning these things. But remember what else John the Baptist said. This is, this is where John the Baptist is asked the Pharisees, who flee, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? They're, they're coming to his baptism, but they're not about to repent and be baptized by him and identified with Jesus Christ. They're just watching. So he warns them, and he says, uh, verse 9, Think not to say within yourselves that we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now, the ac- and now also the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now, what fire is that? Well, verse 12 says, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into the gardener, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The point is, is in verse 10 there, when in the gospel of the kingdom, these people have to bear fruit. You know, there's a lot of the times, in fact, look, look at over chapter 7 of Matthew. A lot of times people use these verses judging a, whether a person's a believer today or not. And, it, and it's a warning here, like in verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets which come unto you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. So, He's warning about false prophets. And as you go down, he uses the illustration of a tree. A a good tree doesn't bring forth bad fruit, and a bad fruit tree doesn't bring forth good fruit. Verse 19 says, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Into the fire. So, again, as as God is dealing with the kingdom saints, part of the gospel message is these people have to believe the word of the gospel and have to bear fruit to enter into that kingdom. And uh, those who don't bear fruit or bear the wrong kind of fruit, they're cut down, cast into the fire. There's going to be a purging of the nation of Israel where God is separating out the believing remnant from the unbelievers and those that are pretenders, sheep and wolves, uh, uh, sheep and wolves clothing. No, (laughs) wolves and sheep clothing. (laughs) And uh, and so the the importance of of fruit is, is all through here. Now, let's just carry that to the next level, to those on good ground. Go back to Mark 4. Yeah, and this, this one I want you to compare with Luke, but let's take it Mark first. It says in verse 20, And these, uh, there we go, And these which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth, some, uh, bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some 60, and some 100. Now, it's not the amount of fruit that God's judging, but the idea of fruit is that these people are rooted in the word of the kingdom, and it has produced fruit in their life. There is, fruit comes out of, out of, as a result of being attached in, in the earth, that fruit is the result of something that's alive. And these people are the ones that possess God's life, and there's fruit bearing in their life. Uh, as you're going to learn from John 15, that they're, they're, they're abiding in Christ. But, but they bear different amounts of fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold, but they, do, they all bear fruit. Now, look at it in Luke 8 and verse 15. Because not only did Luke talk about those that believe, I'm going to go ahead and read verse 14 with it. 
because the believing had to do among those that are on the rock, but they just didn't believe all, all the way through. They believed for a while. Verse 14 says, And they which fell among the thorns are they which when they have ch uh, heard go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to protection, uh, perfection. <laughs> but, that, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, kept it, and, be, and bring forth fruit unto uh, fruit with patience. So, there's a few things there. These that received that, that brought forth the fruit, they they received the word in an honest and a good heart. Not only that is when they heard the word, they kept the word, and not only that, by patience they finally brought forth fruit. And uh, and when you read all that, that's the only ones in this parable that are saved. Now, this is really, if you don't separate the gospel of the grace of God from the gospel of the kingdom, you'll have what people do all the time. They analyze your life and see if they can see fruit in your life and decide who's saved and who's not saved. And usually when they do that, they find some religious person who's acting real holy and they think they're saved. And then they find a carnal Christian and say, no way, you're saved, you're living in sin. But Paul's got a whole letter written to carnal Christians, 1 Corinthians, and if you looked at any one of those Corinthians and judged them that way, you'd say they're not saved. But Paul, when he wrote the book of Galatians, he says to those people, I'm in doubt of you, because those people lived real holy. In fact, they were getting circumcised, making sure that they please God and are part of his covenant people. And Paul said, you get circumcised, God will profit you nothing. The message today is the message of grace. And, and if you don't separate the gospel of the kingdom from the gospel of the grace of God, you'll, you'll operate like you're some judge of fruit <laughs> under the gospel of the kingdom when you can't judge fruit in the gospel of the grace of God. Now, there's fruit there, but fruit comes for maturity, but God saves you just on the basis of grace. But in the gospel of the kingdom, the whole thing here is there's a trial of faith. These kingdom saints are already God's covenant people. They're they're. they're the seed of Abraham, they have blessings, they have God's word, God's been dealing with them, God got, gave them promises that he didn't give to you, and now he's going to try them to find out which one of them really believe his promises. And in that trial of faith, only those that bear fruit are the ones that are going to go into the kingdom, the rest are going to be cut off and, and burned with unquenchable fire because they never did have an honest and true heart. And as a result of that, they didn't keep the word, and by patience they didn't pr produce the fruit. Go back to Hebrews chapter 6. Now, just watch these verses concerning these things. Oh, boy, we're not going to get them all in. I've got to get this one in anyhow. I won't know how to pick up again next week. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6. Did I read down to verse? No, I didn't. We started out in verse 4 about impossible for them to renew them to repentance. And it says, uh, boy. Well, verse uh, 11, it says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that, he, that, ye, may, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, I'm going to have to stop because otherwise I'm going to go into your donut time. But he, he says... Uh, Dan said, I, I got to stop so Tom wants more teaching time. Well, no, Tom didn't want to go into your donut time. <laughs> but uh, that's an important time of our fellowship here. But anyhow, I, I want you to, if you review those things about that, the, that gospel, about the gospel, about the parable of the sower and the seed, the ones who enter in, that, that phrase that's used in the book of Luke, that they enter in because they had patience, I'm going to run some verses with you next week to show you that the kingdom saints, they have to keep God's word and they have to be patient and as a result of that they will bear fruit and go into the kingdom. And, and, and it's real important. I, I, I'll, I'll share why it's important, especially to me, uh, to have a good grasp of that parable, but I'll share that next week. Let, let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you that, uh, that rightly dividing the word of truth sure makes a difference. Otherwise, we wouldn't just think that we could believe and be saved today. 
that we would think that believing is just the first step and there's an awful lot more to do before we can be sure that we're going to have eternal life. But Father, we understand we're in the age of grace and why we're not any better than these people, we certainly thank you that you're dealing with us in this message of grace, saving us the moment we believe and sealing us with your Holy Spirit for the praise of the riches of your grace. And we praise you for those riches today. And help us to understand these things that we might help others to uh, appreciate your grace more. Um, Father, again, we thank you for gathering us together on this day, and we pray that our special time of fellowship on these first Sundays of the month would be honoring to you and beneficial to each of the saints as we greet one another and fellowship more one with another. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.